What I didn't know was I was coming in the middle of a transfer cycle. And so I was on the airplane by myself. I was like the only one flying to Hawaii, but I didn't really understand what was going on. I was just like, I'm going to Hawaii. I'm the only one. Okay. And so, uh, I sat next to this, I sat next to like a family on the plane and the lady was Catholic and you know how you want to like, they tell you like talk to everyone and stuff and you just want to have like this great missionary experience, but I'm kind of a reserved person. Um, but I ended up talking to her a lot on the airplane. And so that was, that was good. And I was expecting at the airport to be met by my mission president, because that's what like the letter in my packet had said, they sent us a letter from the mission saying, have an overnight bag ready. You're going to spend the night in the mission home and the mission president's going to come meet you at the airport. But when I got there, there were, um, just like three sister missionaries there. And so I thought, okay. <laughs> and one of them, uh, she was, she was German. At first I thought she was like a real German, which she is, but she's like half German and like, right, like mostly raised in the United States and stuff. But that was exciting for me because I had this German mission call to Hawaii and I didn't know if there was going to be anybody there that spoke my language. And so that was neat. So I got to, she was my trainer. And so she had come to pick me up with, um, two of the sister training leaders from La Ie. And I did not spend the night in the mission home. And we drove me back around to the other side of the island. And it's a beautiful drive. Um, I think it's one of my favorites just because, I mean, Hawaii is Hawaii. Like, people, they kind of tease you about, like, you're going on a vacation. You're serving in paradise. But it really is. <laughs> it really is gorgeous, just paradise. And um, when I got to the visitor center, because uh, that's where I was, I was called to the visitor center. And so um, that's where you go first in we arrived there and they gave me I'm trying to remember when this all happened. At some point I got a muumu because we were in uniform. And so we spent like whenever we were in the visitor center, we wore this nifty Hawaiian dress. And I think I just like got some time to unpack. And then, yeah, by that time it was kind of later in the evening. And so I don't remember what we did that night, but I remember that I had some laundry that I needed washed and my trainer got up in the middle of the night and changed the laundry. So I woke up the next morning and I said like, Oh, I need to move my stuff into the dryer. She's like, no, you don't. I already did it. And so that was really, that was really sweet of her. Just like, um, yeah, just doing that for me. She's a very service oriented person. And so like there were times when, uh, like we would butt heads about things. Cause I thought, I thought I knew everything. And like, first of all, I was like older than her only by like six months, which isn't that much, but I was older than her. And I just, I don't know, I just thought I was always right. And so she was just extremely, extremely patient with me, which was so good. And she helped me with my German a lot. And um, yeah, being a greenie, it was like kind of some long days, definitely long days, because we would spend, like we'd spend a couple hours a day in the visitor center. And then the other time we would go out and work in our area. And Laie, Hawaii is interesting because it's 92% member. And so there weren't, it wasn't like we were like talking to non-members all the time. Like there were a couple that would live just in, in the wards there. Uh, so it was a little bit, a little bit tricky. And so we just spent a lot of time trying to find people to teach in our area, but also trying to teach people that we met in the visitor center. So kind of doing both, but yeah, I would say I was well-trained. Thanks to sister Cockstetter. <laughs> so the Hawaii Honolulu mission, it covers all the islands. That's a question that people ask a lot, like, are all the islands one mission? And it's like, yes, they are. Uh, so if, when missionaries are not assigned to the visitor center, they usually will bounce around from island to island. Uh, when they are, sometimes they go to a different island. I didn't. So I spent most of my time in La Ie and then for like a two transfer thing for about three months, I was just on the other side of the island in Honolulu. And in terms of like people and languages, there are Hawaiian people there, uh, but it's kind of like kind of like Native Americans where there's just been like an influx of lots of other people and cultures. And so there are some people that still speak Hawaiian, um, but it's more of like it's kind of it was a dying language. It's coming back now, but like most of them, like they speak English. And so other prominent languages um, among the people that live there, there's lots of people from Japan and China, and also there's people from different islands in the Pacific. 
So sometimes there were missionaries that were called Marshallese speaking for people from the Marshall Islands or Chukis speaking. That's another little tiny island um, that's in the Pacific. And also we had missionaries that were called Missionaries would be assigned to serve in Samoan wards and also Tongan wards. And so they would, sometimes you aren't always necessarily called like Samoan speaking or Tongan speaking, but sometimes just like the nature of just like the mishmash of people and cultures that you teach, like I think missionaries would just end up like learning those languages or trying to teach in those languages. And so um, it's definitely like a very multilingual type of mission. The church actually goes like way back to Hawaii. This is a story I got to tell a lot. There was, um, let's see if I can remember my history. I would tell people about this in the visitor center. So the Book of Mormon in Hawaiian, um, it was actually the sixth translation of the Book of Mormon. So they published it in like German and Welsh and French and like a couple European languages and then and then Hawaiian. It was published in Hawaiian. And how that came about was there was a group of missionaries that came from went from California um, to the Sandwich Islands, they were called at the time, to Hawaii, um, including um, George Q. Cannon. Um, and he was one of the, I think he was one of the 12 like back in the day. This was in the, like in the mid 1800s that this happened. And so this group of missionaries came and they were kind of trying to do some missionary work and they were teaching mostly sailors, uh, but they weren't having very much success. And so actually half the group decided just to go back to California, but George Q. Cannon and a few others, they decided that they wanted to stay and keep teaching. And George Q. Cannon had a particular interest in going more inland and teaching the native people. And he was on the island of Maui and he... Uh, Okay, so we'll stop there. So George Kenny was on the island of Maui. And then, this is like the other side of the story. Uh, there was a man named Jonathan Napella, and he was a Hawaiian native, um, also very well educated, so he spoke English and Hawaiian. And he was a descendant of chiefs on Maui, so very well respected. And he lived in um, a village on Maui. And uh, one day, uh, he, had, he had this dream that there was going to be a man dressed in white that was going to come to him with an important message to share. Uh, but he woke up before he got to hear what the message was. And then the next day, George Hugh Cannon walked into his village and he was wearing a white suit. That was something that he wore just like, well, like he was kind of like famous for it, I guess, or something. And so he's wearing his white suit and Jonathan's wife and sister-in-law saw him in the street and they recognized him as the man from the man from Jonathan's dream. And so they turned and they ran away and they ran to go get Jonathan. And so when George Hugh Cannon met Jonathan Napella, he was just like, "Okay, what's your what's your message? I've been I've been waiting for you because dreams are very important to, um, like the the Polynesian culture." And so Jonathan was baptized um, after he heard George Hugh Cannon's message, and then together he and George Hugh Cannon worked to translate the Book of Mormon into Hawaiian. And so after that, there were many people in Hawaii that got baptized, and they built a temple in Hawaii. It's, it's like the first temple that was built outside of, um, outside of like the continental U S. So they built like the four first ones in Utah and then number five was, uh, Laie, Hawaii. And so the church has like a very old, like a very old history there. It goes like back to like, kind of like almost like restoration time, which is really neat. So it's good history. <laughs> Native Hawaiian food. They like poi and that's like, this root that they taro root and they take it and they mash it up and then it ferments a little bit and they just like eat it with stuff. I didn't like it very much, but lots of people like it. So, and also there's like a big Asian influence on the food. And so they make chop suey all the time. And so that's just like, I call them like see-through noodles. They're like these transparent noodles and they just like chuck in like vegetables and stuff. Other than that, you eat a lot of meat and rice. Uh, one of my favorite things to eat was Lao Lao's and that's when they take, I think it's uh, maybe Samoan, but I think like all the Polynesians do it, but just like, they just call it different things. So they take like a hunk of pork and they salt it and then they wrap it in banana leaves. I think it's banana leaves and then they steam it for a really long time. So it's just like super soft. So that was one of the things I loved. Lao Lao's are good. So good food, lots of food. <laughs> People are generous. Members we do so well. <laughs> yeah, it's really especially like, I think like Hawaii in general, but like Polynesian people in general, they're just like very giving. And I think they just, they just have a lot of res 
respect for missionaries, which is very like, just like flattering. It's like, Oh, I'm just like, I don't know. Like we're just like 19 year olds or 20 year olds or whatever, but they're just very kind and very giving. So they have you over for dinner and like, it's just like a culture thing. Like you just eat a lot of food. So yeah, it was good. They're always so kind and just let us into their homes and gave us food. In terms of culture, the people, the mo for the most part, the ones I met, um, in La Ie, there's lots of Mormons. And so <laughs> people are, uh, I think just like your pretty typical, super kind member of the church style. And then even when, even when they're not members of the church, it just seems like the, like the idea of like aloha or like love and like welcoming is a pretty real thing. Like at least with, at least with the Polynesian people I met. Um, and so just like the experience I had with people is that for the most part, they were, they were extremely kind. And then even when I was like across on the other side of the island in Honolulu, my experience there, I served in a really wealthy area. And so, uh, even the people there, like, even though they weren't always interested in like, when we were like tracting and like talking to us, um, they're always polite. Like, I don't, I, I think I only had like a door slammed in my face, like once, like this guy that didn't want to listen. So, but for the most part, yeah, for the most part, people are just like, either like, Oh no, thanks. Or like, Oh, it's cool. Or, or they'll like give you bottled water or something. And so people are just like, yeah, for the most part, super kind. So they're either like kind of, you're just like typical, like American people. And then demographic wise, I don't know what the percentages are, but you run into, um, lots of Polynesians. So like Hawaiians, Samoan, Tongans, people from New Zealand. Um, and also a lot of like other Islander people. So people from Micronesia, um, that's pretty big. There's tons of them. So like Chukis people and Marshallese people and people from, um, Kitabis that have come to Hawaii to live. And I think a lot of them live more like in the city. Like, so like Honolulu, if you serve there. And then there's lots of people, there's lots of Asian people. And, um, then lots of people that are like mixed. And so if you ask someone like, I don't know if this is like necessarily a polite thing to do, but sometimes when it comes up, like people say like, Oh, I'm Hawaiian, Chinese, Portuguese, uh, Filipino. There's lots of Filipinos there too. And so it's just kind of a mishmash of like a little bit of everything. And then there's like, your typical like Caucasian people too. And so that's pretty neat. And then in terms of like cultural do's and don'ts, one thing people always do when they see you is, um, they call them like aloha kisses. So they'll just say like aloha. And then they, they do like the, like they give you a hug and then they do like the touch your cheek and do like a kiss. And they do a pretty good job of like telling you about stuff like that. When I got into the mission home, they like told us like, oh, this is what people do. So they told us like, don't do it to the opposite gender if you can help it. But so like I hugged a lot of ladies, which was nice. <laughs> and so just makes you feel like very like loved, which is good because they're always just like so friendly like that. And then I think another, maybe like a visitor center specific one, you meet a lot of people uh, and sometimes you're really curious about how they all know each other. Cause they're like traveling in a group, but just like, don't ask, like, don't worry about it. <laughs> if you ask them like, Oh, so are you guys brother and sister? And then they say like, Oh, actually we're married. Then it's awkward. Cause I did that. It was awkward because <laughs> they looked like each other. So I thought they were brother and sister. So maybe not asking about like family relationships. And so people in Hawaii belief wise and value wise, um, family is huge with Hawaiian people and Polynesian people. So if you ask someone like, oh, like, who's your friend? They're like, oh, he's my cousin. And even if it's like their mother's half sister's like third cousin, they just like call him cousin. And they're all super close. Like, so like their extended family is really close. And so they're like super close with like fifth cousins. And like, I'm like, I don't even like talk to my first cousins that much. So like family is like a really big thing. And, uh, one thing, uh, belief wise, lots of people are Christian in Hawaii. And so like Polynesian, like not Polynesian, um, lots of people are Christian. And then also I think at least like what I noticed when I was talking to people that lots of the, lots of the Asians, um, they're like, they're Buddhist. And so, um, yep.
we're just Asians, Christian people, just kind of like a pretty big spread of religions, probably just because people come from so many different places. Um, Hawaiian is, yeah, I didn't learn very much Hawaiian. Some of it's kind of used as like slang, which is funny. So people always say, I don't remember what they say. People always say aloha and that's Hawaiian or people say like something's ono and that means good. And, uh, so that, that was kind of fun. So like, I didn't really learn how to like speak Hawaiian, but I did have an investigator that was from Maui and he was like mostly Hawaiian and it was actually his first language. And so he would read the book of Mormon in Hawaiian uh, when we taught him. So that was neat. So it's a good like little just cultural thing to learn about. It's just like fun to have the Hawaiian words. I spent six weeks in the MTC learning German because I didn't have any previous German experience. Like I'd taken French in high school and then Spanish in college and then I got called German speaking. So it seemed like a little bit random and I would wonder like, oh, why am I called German speaking here? Like this is interesting. And it was, I think like mostly like for the visitor center is where I use it the most. And so learning German in the MTC, I really love learning languages. People sometimes would say like, oh, is German a hard language? And I feel like it's like in the middle because, like, you use the same alphabet, just with some accents, and then the pronunciation's, like, a little bit tricky in some places. And the grammar is, like, a little bit more funky than we have. Like, there's some, like, different ideas than in English. And so, other than that, like, German, I would feel, like, not super intensely hard to learn. Like, I did, I did okay, which was good. And then, um, in terms of using it on my mission, one thing I noticed was... Sometimes it was hard to get, like, to get the language study in because our our time as missionaries, like, time as missionary, like, as a missionary is, like, pretty crunched, but we had, like, an interesting schedule with the visitor center because we had to divide our time between, like, our area and our visitor center time, and then we would have, sometimes we'd have shift in the morning at nine, which, like, cuts into your study time, so you're supposed to do after, but if you had appointments, you had to, like, really manage your time well, but I noticed that at the beginning of my mission on the days when I did an, a, like a, a good language study that sometimes like Germans would come in. So it was like the days that I studied, like I got to talk to Germans, which <laughs> was kind of funny. And, um, so they came in, like sometimes people ask me how much, but like, it wasn't really like a steady rate, but I did talk to like, at least like a couple Germans a month. And I had, I'd wear, um, my name tag and then I would wear a German flag underneath my name. And so that, like, sometimes I would walk up to people and say, oh, where are you from? And they'd say, like, I'm from Germany. And it's like, oh, I'm learning German. <laughs> That's what I would tell them. And I guess, like, one thing, yeah, one experience I had was speaking German. Um, this was at the beginning of my mission. I got really frustrated with it because I feel like, at least it's this way for me, when I'm learning a language, it you kind of like, incre like you feel like you're doing really well and like learning a lot and then you sort of plateau and you feel like I'm not learning anything. And at the beginning of my mission, this lady, like this group of Germans came in and I was with my companion who spoke German. So that was good. But she was asking me this question and I just had no idea what she was saying. And so I got really frustrated after she left and I like went in the bathroom and cried just because I was frustrated about it. Um, but then I would have other times when I would have like really good conversations with people. So I think it's just something you just have to keep working on. And I think like one of the experience I had that I treasure the most with speaking German was we, as visitor center sisters, we worked in the Polynesian cultural center as well, which is a facility owned by the church. And it's for people to come and like learn about like the culture of Polynesia and just like have an awesome good time. So it's like a big tourist attraction, but we would go over there and we would offer to take people on a tram tour. So we had this bus that would drive them over to the temple and we'd give them a little tour of the community. And so one day while I was over in the cultural center, just like standing, like telling people about the tram tour, there was this couple that I saw and they were both super tall and they were wearing, they were both wearing all white. So I just like remember that super vividly. But I talked to them a little bit and I found out they were from Germany. And so I like spoke in German with them a little bit. And then the next day when I was on shift in the visitor center, I was, kind of far away from the door and I was uh, talking to somebody else and I just kind of noticed um, the man from the cultural center uh, walked in and I remembered him because he was like super tall 
and like he saw me and I made eye contact with him. And so I walked up front and then, uh, we asked him like why he'd come. And he said that one of the sisters yesterday had like told him about it and invited him to come here. And so my companion and I, we talked to him for like two hours maybe. Uh, and she, she wasn't German speaking. She spoke English. And so it was kind of like this lesson that we had with him that was like mostly in German, but a little bit in English. And sometimes she would like ask a question in English and he'd respond in German, but he was just like in, yeah, his name was Frank and he was from Frankfurt, Germany. And Frank was just, he was in a phase of his life where he was starting to just like ask the questions just like, well, like what's the point of money? Like what's going to bring me happiness? And so we were able to share a lot about the gospel with him, which was a neat opportunity. And we gave him Book of Mormon in German as a gift. And so I think, and we always, in the visitor center, we always tried to get people's contact information so we could stay in touch with them or send missionaries. Um, but like Frank didn't want to leave his info, but he did take the Book of Mormon. And so I'm always just like, <laughs> and I'm just like really hoping I'm just like somebody in Germany needs to find Frank. <laughs> so that was something that was just like a precious experience for me that happened. So I did get to use the language. Uh, I never ate it, but poke, it's like chunks of raw marinated fish. Uh, lots of people love it. I don't love it. Well, I didn't try it, but it's raw fish. And I don't know, maybe someday <laughs> I don't eat a lot of raw meat. So <laughs> that kind of threw me off a little bit. This father and son walked into the visitor center and we're wearing our moomoos, which are like these like long flowy, like Hawaiian pattern dresses, but they don't, they kind of look like a nightgown. Like they're not like very like form fitting or anything. So they're just kind of like, floof. <laughs> and the guy, he looked at their dresses and said, so is this traditional Mormon wear? And my companion thought he said Hawaiian. So she said, yes. And I was like, no, <laughs> uh, just cause there's that, like, I don't know, this kid, like people don't know very, very much about the church in lots of places. And so if that's like their conception, like, oh, they wear those weird dresses. Like, so <laughs> that was just pretty funny, but we were able to kind of say like, oh no, Hawaiian wear. She thought you said Hawaiian wear, which is why she said yes. And I think remember that was one thing, um, because in the Book of Mormon, the word remember comes up a lot. And there's also the parts where it says that like, oh, like how slow and how often quick to forget like the children of men are. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's me. Because I would have like, you have like these amazing, powerful spiritual experiences. But there were times when I would find myself doubting my testimony. And so that was a big one for me just that I needed to like constantly keep strengthening my testimony and also remembering um the experiences that I had the testimony that I had I bought an ukulele and I learned how to play it a little bit I didn't always have much time to practice so and we did gain weight <laughs> so my last few weeks in Hawaii there usually weren't lightning there usually wasn't very much lightning and thunder in Hawaii. Lots and lots and lots of rain, like intense rain. But one of my last nights there, there was this lightning and thunderstorm. And it was like the biggest lightning and thunderstorm that I had ever seen. Like it happened at like two in the morning and we would like, there'd be like this really bright flash of lightning and then just like explosion level thunder, uh, just like strike after strike after strike. And I don't know how long it lasted, but I was just like, laying in my bed like, whoa, if I like turn on the water in the sink, like am I gonna get like electrocuted? And then I was expecting it the next morning, like I was expecting everything to be all like charred and black and stuff like because of how much lightning there was, but it wasn't, it was all fine, but that was crazy. Love it while you're there. Um, it's easy to get, people say like trunky and stuff and like looking forward to like when you're getting back and things and one thing, like, I was excited to go home, um, but also just, like, the more you get there, like, it just becomes, um, like, such a part of you. And so I even have times now when I'll just, I'm going through this phase now where something will remind me of my mission or I'll think about it and I'll just start crying just because it's like, wow, that was beautiful and I loved it and I miss it. And so I think just, like, love it so much while you're there. My friend and I are actually talking about this, how we kind of know what we're supposed to be doing. Like we know, like, 
if I read the scriptures lots and go to the temple and like stay close to God and I'm not distracted by like worldly things, then I'll be happier. And so I think at least for me, like I know that logically, but it's not always easy to execute that. So I think advice for RMs, like just stay, like stay solid on your spiritual stuff. It's like don't let your scripture study slack. <laughs> when I was in Honolulu, we found this lady named Elizabeth and uh, Elizabeth was Korean. I mean, like by blood, but like culturally she was like Hawaiian city girl. So <laughs> she was like this little lady and we met her. Um, I was with my companion and we were just doing the kind of the tracting thing, just like looking for people to teach. And we had knocked on her door and nobody was home. And so we were walking just like back down to the sidewalk and she was coming around on her front lawn and we met her and we asked if we could pray with her. And so we said a prayer with her and then we asked her if she wanted to be baptized, which she said, nope, I'm already like thinking about being baptized in another church. And so we said, oh, okay, uh, well, can we come back and like talk to you some more? And she said that we could. And so we had set this appointment, but I didn't think she was super interested. So I didn't like take it super seriously. But then my companion was like the next day, like on Sunday, she was like, oh, we got to go see Elizabeth. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, I don't really think she's interested. Uh, but we ended up, we went back and we talked with her a little bit. We asked her if she wanted a copy of the Book of Mormon, which she didn't. Um, she was like pretty heavily involved with Jehovah's Witnesses. Like she'd been going to church with them for a long time and like they'd been just coming to visit her for forever. And so, uh, but she did say that we could come back again. And I think it was the third time we went back. We ended up just reading out loud from the Book of Mormon with her. Um, we read in 3 Nephi 11 when the Savior comes to uh, visit the people in the Americas. And she, uh, it was just like, it was a very, I think it, it was just a very good experience. She, Elizabeth loves scriptures and like she loved the Bible already. And then she, like, she also uh, read the Book of Mormon. And at that point, like we started teaching her more regularly and then it became like this uh <laughs> I don't know like almost a pattern of like Elizabeth let's get baptized and she'd be like nope I'm waiting for Heavenly Father to tell me when it's time <laughs> and like and so like obviously like from our perspective we're like you could get baptized like we want you to get baptized but um it was kind of more a timing thing um but Elizabeth she was very committed to like keeping her word so if she told her she was going to be somewhere then she was going to be there so we invited her to a baptism once and she was like, maybe I'll show up like if I'm going to come. And I, it was a, like just an eight year old baptism, like of a member family. And she showed up at the baptism, which was amazing because we didn't know if she was going to come or not. And she just said like, yeah, I was just like sitting in my house. And then like, I just felt, I just felt like I needed to like go and like go to the baptism, like God telling me like, you get up, you get ready, like you get to the baptism. And so that was really neat for us to hear. And then as we were teaching her later on, she gave us her side of the story when we had met her originally. Um, she said that when she saw us on her lawn, her first instinct was to like, tell us to like, leave, like, get out of here. But the way she said it, she said like, but God like stopped me and told me that I should listen to you. And so that was a very tender experience. Just knowing that like, even when you're just like doing kind of the, the grind, like, okay, we're like tracting, we're looking for people that, um, God is with you. And so if you find the people that are ready, then good things are going to happen. And in the end with Elizabeth, like we, I, I left the area, um, but she got baptized, um, with the next companionship, uh, just cause it was actually like while they, the sisters were over at her house, like helping her out with something. Um, they, she just, she just felt like, that's when she just felt like, oh, this is like, this is the, like the church that I want to be a part of. And so that was neat. And also it was very, it was very neat with the members in the ward because we just took like, uh, just like lots of members over to Elizabeth's house to meet her. And we even had one lesson with like the bishop and his wife. And so they were really involved. And so I think that, um, that just helped a lot with that. Cause it's just like, it was very powerful teaching, just having that opportunity to teach with them. So that's Elizabeth. I love Elizabeth. <laughs> Another person is Leah. And 
Leia was living with a member family in Latye and they had um, just like talked to her about meeting with the missionaries and then she ended up deciding that she wanted to have lessons and so she'd come to the visitor center and we would teach her and Leia was just like super solid spiritually and lots of times like I would learn while Leia was like answering questions that we'd asked her as we were teaching her and she just had like a very loving spirit and just like a very strong desire to uh, follow Jesus Christ. And so um, when she got baptized, that was, yeah, that was, that was wonderful. And so one of the things that I'm grateful for that I learned was um, just the idea that when we go out and work, um, God helps us and we get to see miracles. Because when I was in La Ie, since there's so many members, like we would, we would have like district meeting and zone meetings and stuff. And they'd have these like goals for us and say like, Oh, you need to get like two new investigators a week, like, and have so many baptisms. And I would just think like, well, it'd be easier if we had like more non-members to like talk to. We only have like six in our word boundaries. So what are we supposed to do? Like we can't get new investigators, like two new investigators a week. And then I got transferred to that area in Honolulu where there were like miles and miles of houses full of non-members and it was still really hard to find people to teach. And so that was a lesson for me, just like it's all about um, even if you don't know exactly where you're going or like who you're going to find, that when we just say like, okay, like we're here, we don't have anybody really that we're teaching, but we just need to go out and try to find people and just like work and do our part. Uh we would, we found people in that area that were ready just as we were, um, out and about. So like we found Elizabeth on her lawn and then there's this guy checking the mail that we decided to go talk to. And, um, yeah. So just as we were going out and working and doing our part, we were able to find those people that were, that were ready. So that was a very tender experience just that do your part of the work and then like, you'll be able to see yeah, God will magnify your efforts and like lead you to people that are ready. So the weather in Hawaii, it usually stays between like 75 degrees and 85 degrees. There's not much shift. And so it's, it's pretty warm most of the time. Uh, but it is good to bring like sweaters and stuff because you get used to it. And then all of a sudden, like when you're in the, in the seventies, you're like, man, it's kind of chilly outside and you'll like want a jacket. So, uh, that's good. One big thing for me, I never, ever, ever wanted to wear layers. And so if you have like that really cute shirt that you really want to bring and you're like, oh, I can just wear a shirt under it. Like, just like keep this in mind. My favorite outfits were the ones where I could just like put on one shirt, one skirt, and I didn't have to like layer anything because I didn't like layering because it's very humid. And so you're just kind of like, you're sticky and it gets pretty hot. And uh, as part of your visitor center assignment, you do have a muumuu that you wear, but you also need to bring normal clothes. So sometimes people would say like, oh, so you don't have to worry about clothes at all. And it's like, well, we do, cause we can't wear this everywhere. <laughs> so uh, you have to bring like just as many clothes as like a normal missionary, but muumuu's nice. Cause you can just kind of like throw it on if you have to go to shift. So <laughs> that was good. And with your shoes, um, kind of different for everybody and depending on when you're going like it might change with the mission president but all of the sisters like we always wore like they're more common now like people wear them in Utah I see them all the time they're like these five dollar rubber sandals with like the two straps going across and we wore those like every day if we wanted to but if you have feet problems then that's like not enough support if you're like walking around a lot so like in the visitor center and outside of the visitor center people will just wear those all the time so uh, for me, like I had, like I had like my ankles like kind of struggle sometimes. And so I had to wear like normal person shoes. So that's something to keep in mind, just like good comfy shoes, but we are allowed to wear the sandals. And then in terms of staying safe, Laie is pretty safe. Um, yeah, people are pretty secure. Like I didn't really have run-ins with too many iffy people. I know there is like a little bit of drug stuff that happens. Um, especially like in the outlying town. Um, but I didn't have too many times when I felt like super unsafe. Uh, we did have like a couple instances where, um, we would do chats online and then also take phone calls. And so every once in a while you get kind of an unruly or like creepy or perverted person calling, but for the most part, like you just hang up on them or like end the chat and you can like report it. 
so the church has like kind of a system set in like so that you aren't getting the same like weird people calling and then when I was in I think when I when I was in Honolulu we had a car and so that was pretty good and the neighborhoods that I served in were pretty safe and so I think just like being aware of your surroundings is good um just like keeping an eye out for people but for the most part it was pretty I think it's a, it's a pretty safe mission like we don't really have too many incidents of like missionaries being bothered so it's good I'd say well welcome to being a part of as everybody would say, like the best mission on the face of the planet, of course. And I think a pep would be, when I think about the people that, one of the greatest gifts I think that you're going to get from your mission is uh, your companions. And so that's definitely something to look forward to. So even when you're in that moment when you're thinking like, ah, oh, my companion's so annoying, like I can't stand her. Um, if When I think about all the things that I learned from my companions and like when I just like try and like visualize their souls and how beautiful they are and just how much I learned from them, that's something I'm incredibly grateful for. If you got called to serve in the visitor center, um, that's amazing. I know some of the sisters I served with in the visitor center, they weren't expecting a mission call like that, and they weren't expecting that to be their mission. Uh, but serving in the visitor center is like, it's, it's, all, it's all the same like preach my gospel things. You just have different tools and kind of a different outfit, like in our case. Um, and also kind of the amazing experience that people come to us and they wander in and we're in a position to answer their questions. And sometimes it's a question like, oh, what's the big white building on the hill? And you get to teach them about temples. And sometimes they're very, like they're extremely ready and they're willing to meet with missionaries. So just get ready and excited to teach people from all over the world. Um, Cause we literally like met people from every single continent, like every month, <laughs> it was amazing. So we left the MTC and we did a lot of traveling that morning and we flew into Hawaii and it was kind of super surreal. All of us were like, we're actually here. And we got off the plane and walked out of the airport because there's like this outdoor hallway and just the doors opened and it was like, boom, like humidity. And we're all like, oh man, because <laughs> we've been in the plane for like six hours with this like nice fresh cool air. And then we're like, whoa, this is Hawaii. And there's like palm trees everywhere. And I'm pretty sure my face was like, <gasps> like the whole time. And I just, I pretty much the whole first day I walked around like, oh my goodness, like no way. Just like super, super wide eyed. And we went to the mission home. So they drove us back. Um, our mission president, he drove us by like the edge and we got to see the ocean and we're all like, this is so cool. And then we went back to his home and had some food, just got to have some training and things like that. Um, the president gave us some trainings and then he gave us our little they call it the Christmas come early envelope. And basically it says where you're going to be serving, who's going to be your trainer, things like that. So we all just went around one by one and opened our little Christmas letters. And it was crazy because we don't know how to pronounce any of these Hawaiian words. So we're just like totally all over the place, but we, we were just excited. And then the APs would show us um, on the map, which Island we'd be going to, where we would be kind of a little bit, what it was like and what our trainer would be like. So then the next morning we got to go to the transfer meeting. So we came into the tabernacle in Honolulu and there's a lot of people there, a lot of missionaries. And it was kind of crazy. I remember being totally shocked at like how it was like a party in there. And I was thinking like missionaries, like just like super calm and everything, but everyone was like super excited and like cheering. And I was like, what is going on? I was like totally freaked out. I was like, this is not what we signed up for. Like, I'm sure this is not what we signed up for. And I was just like looking around at people like, can you do that? Like, why are they all like screaming and cheering? And they were just like super excited to all like be together and to see everyone. And there's new missionaries coming in and some missionaries leaving. And so they're all excited. And I was just like petrified. And we were all like looking around, like who's going to be our trainer. And I was like holding on to my MTC companion. We were both just like, this is so scary. <laughs> and then they called us up. And as soon as I saw my trainer though, I was just like, 
oh, like I just felt so good about it. And we, she gave me a big hug and I was just like, this is going to be good. And we all got in our zones. And after the transfer meeting, we went back to our houses. And I remember just like, it kind of hit me. I hadn't really thought about this before, but we'd been with missionaries in the MTC, like for these past like week or two. And then we're all with missionaries there when we arrived. And then all of a sudden it was just my trainer and I, and we're like driving. And I was just like, this is so weird. And we just like drove back and she's like, this is our house. And I was just like, this is crazy. And it's just like the two of us. And I was like, the two of us are going to be like adults and we're just going to go out and do missionary work. And it was crazy, but we just jumped right into it. Um, my trainer took me out. We went tracting a lot that first week and it was just really great. We went to our first dinner appointment that night and I was like, we're the missionaries. Like, cause usually we're the people who are feeding the missionaries at dinner. And it was just so weird, but I really, I loved it. And I just felt like it was all going to be okay. I had a great trainer and I just felt like as long as I was doing my best and like trying to pick up on these things and learn these things that Heavenly Father was going to help me to be capable and be able to do the work. I don't know. I feel like as far as like getting on with companions that it wasn't like a struggle or change because I've always been with my sister. Like she and I are close in age and we've always like shared a room growing up. And so for me being with a companion, it just kind of felt like normal and kind of at home. But I guess maybe more the the struggle or the challenges maybe came from I don't know, the weather, the weather, I was like, this is so hot. We're like walking around like tracting and I was like, this is, it's really hot here. And I don't know, most people are really pretty nice though too. So I feel like that first week or so, I really wasn't like shocked by anyone like being mean or rejecting us. I feel like it was kind of like a pretty smooth transition. And like, we met a lot of nice people that first week and it, it wasn't too difficult. But then like, I remember that a time did come eventually where it was kind of like the first time that someone like kind of rejected the message that we were sharing. And I was just kind of like, what, like what is going on? Like that's, it was just hard. And I, I felt I'd like took it super personally, but it was okay because my trainer just like gives me a hug and like, we just, I don't know, Heavenly Father helps us to just feel peace and be like, it's okay. And then the next door was just a nice person and it just, it goes on. So it wasn't too much of a, like a struggle. I didn't feel like I was like smacked in the face with this big like shock, but there, I mean, there are struggles along the way, but there's just so much good and there's so many good people there. I think a new missionary has to be humble. That's probably like the number one thing, because if we go in thinking like, I got this, I'll be fine. Then like, good luck having that on your own. But if we're humble and we say like, okay, I need Heavenly Father's help. If I'm going to do any good for his children, if I'm going to like see the miracles I want to see, then it will be fine and he will bless us with that help and he will help us to work with our companions and he will bless us with the spirit. And so I think humility is going to be like one of the biggest things like coming in, just being teachable and being like, I'm ready to learn because there's so much to learn. <laughs> to be teachable is to see things outside of just your own perspective and view. Cause maybe I think like, Oh, this would be a great way to teach this lesson or this is how I taught it in the MTC. But I learned so many different ways to teach a lesson from my trainer. Um, and even if you think to yourself like, oh, this is a great thing to do as a missionary, maybe Heavenly Father's like, that's a great thing, but I want you to do this today. And so just really being willing to take suggestions or different perspectives from other people and from Heavenly Father, especially because he knows what's going to be best. Always take off your shoes when you go to someone's house. Like that's just what you do. You, if they say like, come in, you just slip off your shoes and you just walk right in. Like, it's just tradition. It's that's the culture. And I don't know so we thought about that sometimes like my companions and I like maybe it's because there's a lot of like red dirt and but we don't really know. We, that's just what everyone does. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of respect for the elderly. That's one thing they say like I remember going to like this little wedding celebration and they're like okay everyone get in line for food kapunas first like all the, the older people first and there's just such respect for um, like grandparents and parents. And yeah, just as a missionary, I would say like, don't freak out if someone tries to hug you. Like it's, I mean like, don't be like encouraging it all the time, but like when old ladies like come up and meet you, they're going to be like, oh, sisters, others, they're just going to give you a big hug and a little kiss. And that's just the culture. It's so, it's actually really cute. I really like it. But like don't not eat the food. That's really important. Like food is love. So like, our mission president and his wife were super 
like on top of the manners, like they, they would give us like Chinese and stuff. And so they always said, first thing, like put your napkin in your lap. So no matter like what culture the family was, like if you had a napkin, put it in your lap, you know? And they always told us like, use your silverware, like hold it the right way. But then they're like, well, some families, they're not going to give you silverware and stuff. So just go with it. So like it says in the white handbook, just follow the host or hostess. And so like as a pre-missionary, like preparing for that, just be okay with that. Like learn how to use chopsticks. I don't know if you don't know, because that comes up sometimes. Sometimes you'll be given a fork, sometimes chopsticks, sometimes nothing. And just go with it. Just like have fun. <laughs> Native Hawaiians are like the best ever. So first of all, when you meet someone for like the first time, just expect to get kissed. Like you could just be tracting and get kissed pretty much. Just like, just on the cheek, it's just like the greeting. You just meet someone and when you're saying bye, you're just like aloha. Or when you just meet them, aloha. And you just, you just give them like a hug and just like a little, it's like a kiss on the cheek. And it's just so, everyone's just so willing to embrace anybody. Like I never felt like just like shunned because I'm like not from here, but they just embrace you and they just welcome you in. They're so generous. They'll give anything and everything to you, um, especially food. They're really, really good at showing their love. I just, they are always so willing to give that. And so it's fun. Everything's just always a party. And <laughs> it's, I really love, I think their focus on like family because that's one of the big things is like Ohana, like everyone is their family and it's not just their immediate family. Like you are part of their family because you're there and because they met you. And if it's just so nice, they just take you in and they make you feel like your family. So it's wonderful. I think that the native Hawaiians are generally pretty receptive to the gospel. And I think a lot of that comes just from their love of others, like their acceptance of others, because they're so willing to to take us in and listen to our message that as they do, they feel the spirit and they recognize the truth that we share and they're willing to make changes for that. Um, some of the things that do believe in, there is a lot of like Hawaiian culture and tradition. And so there are um, different beliefs about like Pele, like different gods and goddesses. Yeah, I don't want to like mess it up because like obviously we don't have Google as missionaries, so I wasn't able to like look it up or anything, but like there's like the god of like the land, the god of the fire, you know, the volcano and it's all because of like Pele and so they have their beliefs in like different gods and and that first but there's a lot of people who are strong members of the church and they still like respect that Hawaiian culture as well, you know. So it, it can be with the gospel as well. But that can be a roadblock for some people if they say like, wait, 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 I believe in this as far as gods go and so I can accept just one Heavenly Father. That they say like, oh, that's like the tradition, that's the culture, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's something that is, generally speaking, it's probably not something that's like actively practiced, but through the dances, through hula and things, they still remember those gods and like show, pay tribute to those. And so it's still like a part of them and a part of their culture, but it's not something that's maybe like actively pursued, generally speaking. So there is still that like belief in that culture about like Pele and the gods, but like there is a strong like Christian atmosphere. Like a lot of people do accept like God, Heavenly Father as their God. And so that's probably not, I, I wouldn't say that that was a big roadblock too much. I don't know. I feel like with each person, it was so different. Like I feel like I, I at least didn't come across a generalizable answer of like what was hard. Cause for some people, maybe like Sunday is just a relaxed day and so maybe they don't want to come to church or some people are like, oh, I'm already in my Samoan church. I don't want to change it. They have something really thick with their culture. Um, but just for everyone, I, I felt like there wasn't like a general like, oh, this is the problem with the, with Hawaiians accepting the gospel. Like, I felt like there wasn't one blanket answer for that. I feel like a lot of the young adults or the teenagers are really open to the gospel there. Um, and I'd probably say the same for, for mainland America too. And generally I think that as teenagers or young adults, people are maybe looking for something more than the older, like the adults who maybe are set on what they have a little more so. But the young single adult wards, I never served in a young single adult ward, but the, generally speaking, I, I've heard great things about those wards that the the members especially are so willing to share what they know and love that they just share that with their friends. And a lot of people 
come to the church because of their friend's influence. This one, I'm so bad with like names. I think it's called like May Day or something. It's like this cute little celebration. I remember I was on Oahu and it was just, the schools did like a little dance for it and they celebrated like all the different islands. So they had like a boy and a girl to represent each one of the Hawaiian islands and they did like this hula and it was kind of like they had like this little like king and queen like royalty kind of all the kids represented the different islands and it was just like a day of celebration and every class did their own dances and so that was really fun to be a part of. Then there's also um, over on the big island of Hawaii they have this one I think I don't think this is like it's not a Hawaiian holiday but they do it up in in Waimea where I was serving just at the time of year when all of the cherry blossoms they just like bloom and it's so beautiful and they have a big celebration for that as well um, and then there's also like King Kamehameha Day and then the day that Hawaii became a state they just have like a couple different holidays like that it's the best so there's I mean you'll see white people there like there's definitely white people like Caucasian and then there's a heavy Asian influence as well there's a lot of Filipino people and then a lot of islanders from like Samoa and Tonga um, and it's, it is very diverse. So like one night we had like three dinners in one night and it was like, um, we had like a white Caucasian dinner and then a Filipino dinner and then a Samoan dinner. And we're like, this is crazy, but it's the best, it's the best mission in the world. Cause you get, there's so much diversity and I guess it, it's kind of mixed wherever you go. Like there are richer areas and poorer areas, but there's people of many cultures in no matter if it's a rich or poor area. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to live in Hawaii? So everyone just comes to Hawaii. <laughs> See, I don't know specifically why a lot of Filipino people come there. I, I would assume probably some of it has to do with job opportunities. Um, and I mean, so there's like, I served in one place where there's like a little Filipino village. So it was kind of like out in the fields. There's like a lot of like um, fields and like plantation kind of work there. But they, they're very hardworking people and there, there's a lot of the Filipinos that we met um, are, are Catholic, so maybe not, they weren't as interested in, in our message that we had, but they were so kind too. Like they would always just be like, oh, just come back another time. Like we'd love to hear your message, even if they weren't interested in, in like, like changing their religion or they're like, oh no, I'm fine with what I have, but thank you for sharing. Like they were super nice too. Probably, well, I served in a lot of military wards actually. Oh. So I, I did teach a fair amount of like white Caucasian people, um, but also Hawaiians as well and Filipino. Like it really was so mixed. Probably, I don't know. It really was so mixed. Yeah, there's, I can't pick one specifically that I taught more and say. Pretty much every day you'll get rice. Like if you're in a military ward, maybe not as much, but other than that, like pretty much every day you'll get rice. That's like the thing. Like in, in like American meal, if we would have like bread on the side or if we'd have like pasta or like anything, it'll just be rice. So just imagine it being rice. And they have one of my favorite dishes that we actually, we got a lot. So that's why I came to love it. It's called shoyu chicken. And it's kind of like, a soy sauce chicken. Oh, I guess that's something good for missionaries to know if they're going to Hawaii. Shoyu means soy sauce. I remember like my first dinner, they're like, pass the shoyu. And I'm like, um, like, <laughs> I don't even know what that is. So the shoyu is soy sauce. So they have this like soy sauce chicken and it's just like boiled in like soy sauce and there's like some ginger in it and it's really tasty. And you just eat it with rice. Another thing they love is spam musubi. So it's like rice with spam on top and then wrapped in seaweed that's super good too it's like it's like how we have like peanut butter and jelly sandwich we like send our kids to school with that they have spam musubi and so yeah rice a lot I'll show you chicken a lot they have this one thing called lao lao and it's kind of like it can be like any meat it's like a meat wrapped in like taro leaves and then they like bake it for a really long time and that's super good. I remember the first time I had it though, I didn't even know what it was. So they like put it on my plate and it's just like this like blackish greenish like lump. And I was just like, um, I'm like looking at my companion. I was like, what is, I'm like watching how everyone else is eating it. And I was like, okay, I had no idea. And I was like trying to figure out what it was while I was eating. And I was just like, this could be like seaweed. And I don't even know what this meat is. And I was just like so scared. And afterwards I was like, what was that? What did we eat? And she explained it. And I was like, oh, that's not so bad. Like. <laughs> 
And so from there, I came to like it more knowing what it was. Like next time I saw it, I'm like, oh, okay, I know this. <laughs> and then poi is one of the huge things there. So it's like taro, but it's like mash up into this kind of like, so I guess taro is kind of like a mash, like a potato in a way. And so poi is kind of like mashed potatoes a little bit, but it's like more, the consistency is more like syrupy maybe. And yeah, it just kind of like drips off your little spoon. But I I don't really care for eating it just plain. It's The flavor is kind of bland, I think. And the texture is a little bit weird for me because it's just too like kind of gluey a little bit. But when you mix it in with rice and lala and stuff, it's... It's too, it's good. <laughs> just be okay with rice, like just, just learn to love it. Cause like we would always just joke about it. Like, oh, I wonder what's for dinner tonight. Like if our day was long, we're like, okay, I wonder what's gonna be for dinner tonight. Rice, like just, just have fun with it. Like joke around with it. And I came to love rice a lot more <laughs> because of it. Yeah. I had like this tiny little bite. We went to this Filipino restaurant one time and they're like, eat this and then we'll tell you what it is. And I was like, um, and so they weren't like super like set on us eating like it wasn't just like here's your portion of this food eat it but it was just like everyone was just eating little things off of the center of the table at the restaurant so we're like okay so everyone just kind of like tried a little bite and afterwards they told us it was um ground up pig's face so i i'm not sure i, I got a tiny bite so i don't know if i like had the actual ground up pig's face but that's what the the dish was in general so it didn't taste that bad. It just was like, that's meat. Like, And then they had this like cattle ranch kind of. And they went in the morning and they got some cow part, guy cow part that you wouldn't necessarily want to eat at all. And they just like chop it off, fry it up. And then we we're like, yeah, we'll try that. That'll be fun. We took one bite. We're like, okay, that was great. <laughs> Thank you for that experience. <laughs> it was funny though. They weren't pressuring us to eat it. They're just like, if you want to try it, you're probably never going to get this anywhere else. <laughs> but it was crazy. Talk about the food because they're, they're so generous. They're, they're going to want you to leave absolutely full. And so if you're not absolutely full and, and if they don't know that you're absolutely full, then you're going to need to keep eating socially. And so what I would say is just like when you get there, just like tell them how amazing the food looks. Like as you eat it, tell them how amazing it is because they've, they've worked hard to prepare that. And just the food is like a big part of the, the culture. So like talk about that. And then if you think you're like starting to kind of get full, make sure to tell them how full that you are. Because if you don't, then they're going to think that you're still hungry and they're going to keep serving you. And that's great. But then eventually you'll get to the point where you can't move and you can't, <laughs> you're going to be really full. And so just be like, wow, like this is so good. I am so full. And then the thing is that a lot of times with Polynesian culture, full doesn't necessarily mean you're going to stop eating. So they say, they say you don't eat until you're full. You eat until you're tired. That's what they say. So you have to say like, you're tired basically. So I'd be like, oh my goodness, I'm so full. I'm going to fall asleep. Like, I just feel like I need to take a nap. And they would get, they would get, they'd be like, oh, you're so good. Like eat a little bit more. And, um, and then one other thing, I didn't know this when I, when I got there, people would be like, oh, kanak attack. And I was like, uh, like, was that something I have to pass it on the table? Like, I don't know what this is. So kanak attack is basically like what we'd call like a food coma. Like just when you eat so much that you want to sleep. And so sometimes we say that too. We're like, oh, I'm so full. I'm going to have kanak attack. Like, and that's just, they, then they get it. They're like, oh, she can't eat it anymore. So then you just like finish up what you have. You know, arriving into the mission was, um, was interesting. I came in with the new mission president and he didn't really know what he was doing either. So he had only been there for about a couple weeks or so. And so, you know, he took us around and, we went through, I, you know, I couldn't believe I was in Hawaii, you know, it was, Honolulu is just a completely different, it's a city life, and so I was like, you know, where, where's all the green, where's all the water, and all I saw was concrete buildings, and a freeway, and really, you know, bad transportation, you know, it was just all, lots of traffic and stuff, and, but we went to his house, and he just talked to us, and, you know, I was just, I was just, we were tired and, and hungry, but, um, you know, we met our mission president and the next day we met, I met my trainer and my trainer was, um, she's from the, she was from the visitor center. So she, they pulled her out to train me and also, um, to what we call whitewash. So we, both of, both of the missionaries were new to the area. So we whitewashed into the area and she had only been out for about three months. 
And so she came out and trained me. And having a visitor center sister um, was different as a trainer and different, you know, good and bad. But um, I think she taught me things that a normal, you know, full proselyting sister couldn't have taught me. But our first week was, was a little crazy. We didn't have a phone or a car or an area book. And so a lot of it we depended on the other set of sisters and so lots of just trying to do a lot of logistic stuff and, and things like that. But it was it was a good it was a good long week, long first week. And it was a shock coming from the MTC into the field because at the MTC, you know, all the scheduling is just it's rigid and it's given to you, but in the field, you know, you can basically do whatever you want and and schedule whoever you want, talk to whoever you want, and so it's really up to you, like what kind of experience you wanna, you wanna have on a mission, because it really is just, it's just how you, how you want it. So the Hawaii Honolulu mission is a really unique mission. Um, we cover all the islands, and not just Oahu, but um, we cover I think six out of the eight islands. So there's Kauai, there's Oahu, there's Maui. Um, the Big Island, um, Lanai, and Molokai, and so those are the eight island of uh, six islands that we cover, and um, so transfers are really interesting because it also involves getting on a plane, going to a different island. Um, the mission office and the mission home are on o on Oahu. They're in the Honolulu zone. Um, they're in the city, and so that's where we call the hub. You know, all the missionaries gather there for transfers, we leave from there, and so um, I was fortunate to be in that zone. So I saw a lot of missionaries come in and out, a lot of things happen, and I was really up, up to date with things. But, you know, when I was on a different island, um, it wasn't that much. It wasn't so. Um, the, the missionaries all have an opportunity to go on a different island. And which is really lucky. I was lucky. I was on two different islands. I was on Oahu and the Big Island for about the same amount of time. So I was on Oahu for 10 months and eight months on the Big Island. And so really lucky, totally different. All the islands have their own little culture, their own little thing. And Oahu is more of the city life. Um, the Big Island is very much country, small town, country, big space. And so, um, you know, just very different, very different. The church in Hawaii is, there are a lot of members, um, but there's also, there, were, there are also a lot of less active members. And so a lot of people, even if they aren't members of the church, they'll know, they'll have a family member who's a member of the church, or they'll have like in-laws who are members of the church. And, and so there are, we are pretty well known in, in, in Hawaii. Um, they know us as the, the Mormon missionaries and, they kind of know. They think they know what they what we believe in, but most of the time they they don't. But and um, yeah, just there are two temples. There's a temple on the Big Island, and there's a temple on Oahu. So Laie is where the temple visitor center is. So sisters are specifically called to the visitor center to serve there and to give tours and things like that. It's also near the Polynesian Culture Center and BYU Hawaii is also there. Um, the Kona Temple on the Big Island is smaller, as very small, there's only like one room. Um, and so, but it's beautiful. Both temples are beautiful and, and it's in areas that really um, serve the people around the, you know, the surrounding islands and and I was fortunate that we got to go every three months. And so as long as we were on an island with a temple. So I was on an island always throughout my mission with a temple on it. And so I was really lucky with that. And, it, you know, it's a, an experience, different experience in and of itself to go to the temple as a missionary. You know, there's different things that you ask for and that you pray for and that you, you kind of receive revelation for. And so... It's a good, it's a good mission. <laughs> yeah. So we usually fly um, to different islands, and so keeping the 50 pound limit was easy for us because a lot of us had to leave, and um, yeah. So we flew, and it's unique because it's one of the most expensive missions in the world, not just because of the housing or you know the um, living expenses, but also because we flew around a lot. 
And so um, the leaders of the mission would fly, um, I think once a transfer, so all the mission leaders would come in from the different islands to Oahu and go back go back to the different islands. And our mission president and the assistant would also travel around for his own conferences and interviews. So you go to each island. So it's it's a pretty in, expensive and intense way to, to do transfers, but it's fun. You get to talk to a lot more people on the planes and, and things like that. Well, the culture of Hawaii is very, we call it the melting pot. And it's because Oh, there's so many different cultures. There's so many different kind of people that go there. You know, we have the white people and we call them the Hali people. And then there's the Asian. And within the Asians, there's the Chinese, Japanese, Korean. You know, there's a lot of Vietnamese people I came across. Um, there's also the Polynesian people. There are the Samoans or the Tongans. There's also the, the other islanders, the Marshallese people, you know, the Micronesian islands and, you know, all they come from all walks of life and they just come here and and just you know we get different foods and we get all a variety of people and languages and so some missionaries so we have Samoan wards and Tongan wards and and also Marshallese wards and and other oh there's so many wards there but so many language wards there and so they they'll come in they'll go into the ward and and they'll learn the language, they'll pick it up super fast because they're working with the people. And one of the best ways to, to really um, get on a personal level with the people is to, is to learn the language of them. You know, they feel a really deep connection between you and, and them when you really learn their culture and you really delve, you know, delve into their culture and just learn about how they work. And, and once, you, once you learn that, you know, not only do you get a personal connection with them, but but you you get to you you learn how they act, and you so you learn when it's a when if when it's a good idea to to say something or not to say something, and and so you know the people in Hawaii generally are just so loving and so giving, and and that's really one thing that I've learned from the people is to love and to give, and we call it the aloha spirit, but. It really is just them. They just love and welcome everybody, you know. They have their own little, you know, weaknesses here and there, but they just are just a very loving and giving people and very charitable. Um, they, they're very honest sometimes <laughs> when they want to be. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't try and sugarcoat anything, um, which is something that I love because it really, I you don't know, they... When they're honest with you, they're honest with you. When they're when they're friends with you, they'll protect you. And so I became a lot of, when I became good friends with my investigators. You know, if anything happened to us, they would get angry for us, and it's like, no, it's okay, you know. So they're very protective of the people they love. Family is a huge thing. Um, they love their family. They're related to everybody. Half the island is related to each other. <laughs> they, you know, they're like, oh, that's my cousin. And really, it's like they're third, fourth, you know, first, you know, removed cousin type thing, but they love each other. They're all family. They have, they use every excuse to gather together as a family and to have food. Food is a huge thing in the culture. Um, they nickname our mission the 40 pound mission because the average gain is 40 pounds and more plus more because they really feed us. They feed us so well. Um, every night we had a meal and not just one plate but they made us take like three plates and leftovers home and so you won't starve if you get into the mission that's for sure um they they just love food and food is a way to get to know each other to have fun and to talk about things and so you know uh just you know the, the i i you know i just love the people i just love how they how they work and how they function and there's they just they just love each other, you know, when they do, they love each other. Generally, people in Hawaii are, they're super religious. Um, they believe in some, if it's not God, they believe in some kind of higher being and that's looking out for them. Um, you rarely come across atheists or, um, you know, people who don't believe in God and or higher being, but you'll, you'll find a lot of, um, there's a lot of Christians, um, a lot of, there's also a lot of Buddhists among the Asian people. 
they're a little harder to get because you know they're very firm in what they believe in. Um, uh, you know the Jehovah Witnesses are there, and uh, there's a couple of uh, contemporary Christian churches. Um, they really love that. They really love entertainment in churches. <laughs> um, there's also a lot of Hawaiian churches, so they believe in the Hawaiian gods and and things like that. And so generally, when you come across people, they're they're very religious. They they believe in something, and they believe that they're they're here for a purpose. They, you know, they may not know what the purpose is, but they, they really do believe that um, they are here for a purpose and that they, a lot of them actually believe that they'll be together with their with their families, you know, because family is such a huge thing. And so one thing we always try and to, to touch them with is that families can be together forever, even after we all die, and that we can be together with God. And so they really like that. They really love the plan of salvation and they really, um, that really clicks with them. So for sisters, um, clothing, the people in Hawaii are very casual. So the more expensive you dress, the less likely they'll talk to you, which is interesting. They, you know, uh, and so we dress, we dress a little more casual than most missions. And we also get to wear, um, we call them Jesus slippers. And so they're just, they're just shoes that have two straps and, um, on the top of them and, and you can get them for like five dollars there and so if the mission president still lets you wear them they've been letting the sisters wear them for a really long time and so I know I bought some expensive sandals which I never used on my mission but I just bought like five dollar slippers and it's really convenient slip because you have to take off your shoes when you go into people's homes and so having sandals was a little more inconvenient because you had to you know, take out the strap and put you know and put it back in and so the slippers you just slip on and off go into people's homes and um come on and slip them off uh, slip them on again and and so also i would not recommend layers because it gets really hot and humid in hawaii maybe in the winter months when it gets a little chillier you know whatever that means but <laughs> when it gets a little colder you know you can layer up a little bit but uh usually during the spring and summer months like it gets really hot and humid and in some places in the mission and so you know, I wouldn't recommend something flowing you know that can flow and just light and, and airy and so that would, that's what I would recommend um, you're gonna be walking around a lot and out in the hot sun so you know just travel as light and and as airy as possible so the air can come in you'll be you'll be chill and cold and you'll be fine <laughs> Oh, Hawaii is just, it's just rain, <laughs> rain, rain, and more rain. Um, one thing about Hawaii is, is that sometimes it'll just rain randomly for two minutes and then it'll stop. And it could be sunny, you know, it could be a great day, but it'll just rain. And it's just the most random thing ever. Uh, we did have a couple hurricane warnings, nothing too big. Um, we're really, really blessed because Hawaii doesn't really get a lot of, uh, you know, natural disasters like that very often. But we did have about, we had three hurricane warnings when I was there towards the end of my mission. Uh, the big island, I had left right before this happened, but um, it is where the volcano is. And so the volcano does er is erupting, erupting, and... It was leaking lava. Lava was coming out, and it was going towards a town in, whole, in on that island. And so they had to cut off that town and evacuate a lot of people. And so that's one of the craziest things I've heard. It, it's <laughs> we don't really get a lot, you know, not too many tsunamis and you know, a couple of hurricane warnings, but the lava flow is <laughs> is interesting. <laughs> Oh, it has to be from the Filipinos. <laughs> oh, I love the Filipino food, but I never ask what's in it. But I helped skin a cow, a butcher cow, and um, they, the Filipinos, they don't just eat the meat, they eat everything else too. And so, cow intestines, um, cow heart, you know, all that fun stuff. We also have, they also have something called pork blood, which is pork with the pork blood over it. Yeah, 
interesting things. <laughs> but good food, you just don't ask what's in it. <laughs> About the Hawaiians, they're really, I don't know if it's the island feel or, or something, but they, they do believe in spirits and they believe in ghosts and they talk about it a lot and I think that's one of the reasons why they have a really eerie feeling sometimes especially when you go to the outer islands and but I was in my last area which is on Oahu and it was on Oahu and we were we tracked it into this couple and we we were teaching them and they weren't even from Hawaii they were from New Jersey so we were talking to them and all of a sudden he brings up that his wife is has a little friend that's a spirit or a ghost and she started talking to us about her hearing footsteps on the upper floors and and every time this is this is a testimony to me because every time we tried to teach the restoration it took us three hours to teach the restoration because every time we taught it we would go on with it something weird would happen. The lights would start flickering. The dogs would start barking. You know, they would get distracted by something else and they would come back and it was just a really eerie feeling. And and I don't know if because I was a missionary, I could really feel that and really like um, know that something was wrong. But, you know, some crazy things like that happen all the time. And <laughs> we just have to know just to laugh it off and we were creeped out for a day or so but after that we were just like no it's fine you know it's okay we're protected Heavenly Father will protect us but yeah <laughs> one of my investigators was having a really hard time and she her daughter had gotten baptized um, about a month before and she you know she Brand, her name is Brandy, and Brandy was, was an, is an incredible woman. Like, she did drugs and, you know, meth, crack, you know, all that stuff, and smoked really heavily and did all these really bad things. But um, when we introduced the gospel to her family, she really changed and really, um, it really made a difference in her life. And so we had promised her um, the day before. Sunday that we would come and stop by on Monday and Monday was our PD and so sometimes we're really protective of our PDs of our preparation days and and we had an appointment at about 6:30 PDs and ended at 6 and so we were on our way home to drop off our groceries before we went to our appointment at 6:30 and so it was about you know 6:15 6:20 and we were going to be late for our appointment and you know I I turned to my companion cuz she had been on my mind the whole day and I said, hey, maybe we should go visit Brandy real fast before we go to our appointment. And she was like, ah, oh, well, you know, we're gonna be late, and you know how our member doesn't really like it when we're late, and and things like that. And I was like, okay, fine. And so, you know, kind of pouted a little bit, and then my companion goes, okay, well, maybe we should go. She could have been waiting for us for the whole day. Drop off our groceries, we went over and visited her. And as we were coming up, she got really excited. She was sitting on her porch. She got really, really excited. We walked up and she said, do you know what happened? She said that night, she last night, that night she had a dream that her daughter had, you know, hit her and slapped her and said she wasn't worth it. She wasn't worth the gospel. And, and you know, I think, you know, Satan was just working really hard on her, saying, telling her things that weren't true, that we didn't care about her, the sister missionaries didn't care about her, that no one cared about her, that she wasn't worth the gospel and things like that. And so she she prayed and she told God to bring the sister missionaries and that if she didn't, if the, if the sister missionaries didn't come, she wouldn't believe anymore in God. And so she told us that and I, I was about to hurl because <laughs> if we had not gone up, you know, everything would have changed. Everything would have been so different. And just listening to the spirit, you know, that was the most frightening and also the, one of the most spiritual experiences that I've had because I learned that we weren't wrong. You know, everything we do or think isn't ever wrong. You know, as long as it doesn't feel wrong, it's not wrong. And so, you know, just don't be afraid to go and, and do something because, because even if it doesn't work out the way that you're thinking, it... It, it still isn't wrong, you know, it's still part of Heavenly Father's plan. 
And so whatever feeling that you're feeling, as long as it's not wrong and your companion agrees, you know, just go and do it because you never know what's going to happen. You never know if it was between believing in God and not believing in God. And, you know, those experiences, I didn't really have a lot of those, but that one was just a testimony to me that, that we do have the spirit. You know, missionaries, they do have that mantle that really helps them to, to further their work. One of the best skills has to be communicating, communicating with other people. Um, it, I think a lot of people have problems with that because they they feel like, oh, I don't want to offend people, or you know, I don't want to hurt their feelings, you know, I don't want to come across as this or that. But being able to articulate words or communicate in a way that that allows people to to really know what you're talking about. And and also working with other people, you know, you're with a companion, 24 hours, seven days a week, it gets kinda, get kinda rough sometimes. <laughs> get kind of sick of them. But being able to say to my companion, like, I don't like it when you do this, or I like it when you do this, in a way that you were, the two of you were able to um, work together and cooperate and, and that's all that when that happens that's when the spirit comes that's when the spirit really works that's when you have the, the companionship unity and i was able to have uh, that with the with a couple of my companions not only did we get along really well but we were able to be honest with each other and say you know what i don't agree with you because this and it's okay to to not agree it's okay to compromise you know you're working with somebody else for a really long time and and so that, 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 yeah, that's some things that I've learned. <laughs> I think one of the hardest experiences um, that I don't really tell a lot of people, but I mean, it'll be, it'll be helpful for some of you, but towards the end of my mission, I had a crisis <laughs> with the fact that I had never, I had never trained anybody or been in a leadership position. And that was really hard for me, for, for me, because I was a person throughout um, my teenage years that, you know, I was part of the youth council and I was on the class presidencies. I'd been, I was heavily involved in organizing things for school and, and also for the church. And, and to come on my mission and not have that was really hard for me. You know, it wasn't hard for some people, but it was hard for me. And and I was frustrated because I was like, well, I felt like Heavenly Father didn't trust me. Or my mission president didn't trust me enough to hand me a new missionary or have me be in charge of of other sisters and their well-being. And um, it's something that, like, you know, five months later after my mission, I'm still working on because I don't, I still don't know why. And I have to be... I have to be okay with not knowing why and I you know I'm still working on that. I think that was one of the hardest experiences because I just felt not a failure but I wanted to I want I had wanted to make a difference as a missionary and I, I felt like I didn't I hadn't had that and I wasn't able to pass on my knowledge to anybody else um, to be able to make that difference. And so my companions helped me a lot and you know just thinking about it and lots of prayers and and things like that but that that's really one thing that that I have to anybody has to really remember is that how many you know as I said you know Heavenly Father has a plan he always has a plan but sometimes I'm not okay with that plan <laughs> and so I have to be I have to be okay with that I have to be okay with also not knowing why and I, I'm pretty sure I I won't figure out why till a lot later or maybe even when I go up to heaven and, and ask God, like, you know, why did that happen? But that really is a good, um, good value, I guess, to learn as throughout life is that you don't have to know why things happen because things happen the way it happens. Yeah. Oh, best advice for returned missionaries. That's hard because I'm still adjusting, but I think the best the best advice I could give is to is to take one thing at a time, not to take in all the changes and try to change everything at the same time, but to take one thing at a time. Keep yourself busy, 
always because when you have nothing to do I think that's when the hard that's that's when it's hardest um your my family I think had a hard time with with the old me and the new me and the missionary me and trying to, to get everything and I had a hard time with it too but just to take one thing at a time you know just look at each aspect of your life and say okay what do I want to keep what do I want to change you know what do I want to mesh together with the old me and the missionary me and and to keep and and to keep some habits from the mission you know the the my stake president told me that my mission is is basically preparation for the rest of your life and so to take things from your mission and apply it into your life so for someone who has just opened their call to the Hawaii Honolulu mission you are opening your call to the best mission in the world <laughs> and it I know that my mission has blessed me you know it's gonna be hard it's gonna be you have to work hard but also remember to have fun your mission is supposed to be the funnest and awesomest time that you have on your mission uh, in your life and you know just remember that that it's okay to laugh and joke and, and work hard all at the same time it's possible um, I know that the mission is just gonna bless you even more in your life it's blessed me in my life um, I'm able to, to see the blessings that I have and I want to give and keep giving and that's what in Ho that's what the Hawaii Honolulu mission is gonna gonna help you do is to give more and to give back to people to help people and to learn more about how people work and how different cultures can mesh together and you now I know that Heavenly Father he's he's pretty proud of you right now because you're you are opening that call and you are planning on going on that mission and he's not going to to leave you alone he's always going to be there even when you do feel alone you can always turn to him and I know that and I know that he he loves you and his children and he wants the best for you so keep going keep doing even when you're down keep just keep working just keep going don't ever give up the MTC was just a blur we were only in there for 10 days and it just went by so quickly and I just remember packing up on the front runner to go to Salt Lake and we were all so excited and we all were just so excited to get to the better weather and the airplane ride was like the longest of my life. I sat next to an elder and we were just like talking the whole time about how excited we were. Um, we landed and it's in Hawaiian culture that you receive a lei. They actually gave us a kukui nut lei when we got off the plane. And just right away, I just felt so at home. And also, it was very muggy. I remember just getting off the plane and realizing I'm not in Utah anymore. <laughs> so they took us to the mission home. It's a beautiful drive, um, probably about 30 minutes from the airport. We were just all looking outside right along the beach, just like, I don't know, I was just floored, like, wow, this is really happening. I am in paradise for my mission. <laughs> and they sat us down, and they went through kind of, you know, the first mission day kind of stuff, and um, we were able to open our, they call them Christmas letters that night, to know where our first assignments were. And what's unique about Hawaii is that the mission is spread out on several different islands, and so it was very exciting to see people getting called to different islands. Um, me particularly, I went to Kauai all by myself. I was the only one in my group of about 23 that received a call off um, to that island. And so it was a little scary. I had to travel by myself <laughs> to that island while other people stayed on the main islands and other islands. So that was that was interesting. But as soon as I met my first companion and it all it just all worked out from there. <laughs> Missionaries, I feel, in the MTC are given one thing and then you go out to your mission and you experience like the different facets that each mission has to offer. And so for um, serving in the Hawaiian Islands, the people there are so loving. And so <laughs> there, there were many times that um, men would approach you and give you a hug and a kiss. And that's nothing out of the ordinary there. And it's almost rude if you do not accept. And so that was a little getting used to because in the MTC, we we're just like, okay, hey, men, women, just stay there. But in the islands, it's just like everyone's family. And so um, you're, you're able to find a balance. But definitely I hugged and kissed more people on my mission than I had my entire life. <laughs>
<laughs> and you know, it's just an, an aloha kiss just on the cheek. Um, but some of the elders I know got big smooches from the older aunties in the wards. <laughs> So elders watch out, <laughs> but it's just how they show you their love. It's wonderful. Um, another thing that was kind of a struggle is the children as missionaries, you're not supposed to hold children, but the people there just give you their child. If their child's crying, they'll be like, oh, sister, hold while I cook the food. And so you kind of had to work around that as well. Um, dance and song is huge in the culture there. I love the dance and song. Um, you're able to go to luau's, you eat a lot of food, and you're able to see the traditional dances, which are just beautiful. Um, at the end of our mission, we actually get to go to the Polynesian Culture Center and are able to view the night show with all the different cultures. And it's just so wonderful to see a mesh of all the people and the similarities that they have. And it really brings the spirit, too. Um, I, <laughs> I never thought I'd have that connection with with the islands, but I just have grown to love the culture. I actually um, decided to add to my major after my mission because I just grew to love the culture so much. I wanted to explore it more and it's just beautiful and you definitely see how God has had a way with it because those people are definitely full of the spirit and ah, uh, just, yeah, I love it. So I started my mission on the island of Kauai. It was on the North Shore in Hanalei. It was a very touristy area, very transient. I was actually in a branch. It's one of the few branches on the islands. Um, and then I went to Big Island, Waimea. It's like right smack dab in the middle of the biggest island. It's kind of more of a cowboy town, Hawaiian cowboy. I just never thought that would happen. <laughs> um, snow's on the mountains there. And then I went to Honolulu, so right downtown where everything happens, where there's millions of people. And then I went off to the west coast of Oahu and Makakilo area. And so a big variety of culture wherever I went. Um, of course, there are a lot of Polynesians, a lot of Hawaiians, Samoans, Tongans, um, Tahitians. There's all the Pacific Islanders, and also there's a lot of Asians, which I hadn't really realized that that was a big major part of Honolulu area especially. Um, I had a Japanese speaking companion in one of my areas and we were able to reach out to a lot of the Japanese members there. Um, also Filipino, I believe there's about 52 different languages spoken on the islands of Hawaii. So that just goes to show how many different kinds of people there are and it's just a melting pot. It's so beautiful to see all the many kinds of people. So I was able to work with, um, you know, the Mar Marshallese, the Chukis, um, those are the Micronesian Islanders and Polynesians. It was just wonderful. Some of the food, it definitely has getting used to. Um, Polynesians especially, they love their fatty foods. And there's the cultural dishes such as lau lau. It's a um, pork and corned beef wrapped up in a lau lau leaf. And they, it takes a long time to make. And so when they make it to you, it's really special and important. Um, but it's definitely something you have to get used to, the taste. Um, as well as I know in my first area, it's the poi capital of Hawaii. And if you don't know what poi is, it's mashed up taro. It's a little bit like a potato mashed up. It's very sour. And so the first time I tried sour poi, um, they actually sit it out on like their front porch and let it rot so there's mold in it. And then they eat it like with their fingers. They just love it. And so <laughs> my companion and I were at a girls camp um, helping our branch do something and they brought out the sour poi and it was like grayish black and everyone was taking big old scoops of it. And so I was like, oh sure. So I took a big old scoop and it was nasty. So, I mean, there are some cultural dishes that are definitely not anything like you're used to, but I miss the food of Hawaii. Um, it definitely makes you gain the weight. People... People on the islands, that's how they show you their love, is through the food. And so I don't think I ever had to cook my own dinner on my mission. Like maybe twice, and that was super rare. Um, members would just take you in under their wing and feed you. That's how they showed you their love. We would have two to three dinners some nights. <laughs> and so we'd walk in, we'd try to teach a lesson, and they'd be like, oh, sisters, come eat food. And you can't just eat one plate. So um, you get a big variety and I mean my suggestion is just love the food and the people will love you.
pray for it. I had a companion. She had to pray for it because she had a really hard time with the food. But um, it's nothing too out of the ordinary. A lot of seafood, um, a lot of cultural dishes. But the fruit is amazing. And just uh, everything. I could just go talk forever about food. I gained a lot of weight on my mission. But it's all good. It comes off after. So... <laughs> In the Polynesian culture, the church is very strong, and I know the um, the missionaries, the Christian missionaries, came over and introduced, you know, the concept of Jesus Christ to the people there, and they readily accepted it. And I believe it was Joseph S. Smith called to serve there when he was 15, and it was really cool to hear stories about when he was in Hawaii. One in particular, I remember that they were. I believe off the coast of Maui, they were going to visit the members there and their boat capsized. It was just a little thing and Joseph S. Smith actually um, began to drown. And so his companions pulled him out of the water and they were able to do CPR and he was brought back to life. And I just thought that was so cool that I don't know, that happened on the very islands. It just as a 15 year old boy that he was able to be called there. And uh, I remember reading about how when he went back there were the old aunties the the women he had taught and baptized would you know welcome him as a son and that's how the culture is there and so it was just really cool to hear from a prophet's perspective i think number one is clothing um like you see the sister missionaries on the church lds website and they're in their pencil skirt and nice florally like fluffy fluffy i meant um lacy tops Hawaii just do not dress like that at all. I I had a bunch of dress clothes, like professional attire, and I sent it all home within the first month because the style there is very relaxed. Um, long, flowy skirts are the best. Sisters in that mission were kind of treated like queens in the fact that they don't like us riding bikes. Um, Hawaii can actually be kind of dangerous. It's a third world country, really, in some parts. It's very poor, and so they really didn't like sisters um, walking or um, biking after night and so usually you have a car um, as far as for shoes don't go out and spend a lot of money on nice pair of walking shoes because everyone seems to get the Hawaiian slippers um, they're just like five dollar slippers at Walmart you can get there and they last you forever and they're super comfortable so I would not spend any money I think I spent like two hundred dollars on nice sandals that I never wore um, and then again with the clothes, it's very humid there. Um, but also in the winter, in my certain area I was in Waimea, it snows on the mountain so it can get really cold. But I wouldn't worry about bringing colder clothes because the members take care of you. They'll give you clothes. <laughs> They'll show up on your doorstep with scarves and coats and anything that you need. Um, but I would definitely pack long, flowy, and bright and colorful you know, clothes and you can totally get away with it. You're either called to be a visitor center sister or a full proselyting sister, and both have equal and important roles in the mission field. Visitor center sisters have a very different schedule than proselyting sisters. They're able to go out full pros for a few transfers, um, but they definitely play a different role in the visitor center. That's where you have all the languages and they get to take uh, people on the tram tours and have amazing experiences with huge tour groups coming in from China and Japan and they're able to teach the gospel to them in their native tongue. And we actually had a group of, I believe it was 20 to 30 Chinese people who came over to accept the gospel and were baptized and were taught within a few, few days. Um, some elders and sisters helped out with that. So that's definitely something very special, the visitor center sisters. I was a full proselyting sister. We are able to, I mean, we work just as the elders do. We don't have the visitor center schedule. Um, it is a lot of walking, you know, just as any mission, but we do have cars. Other tips, I mean, it's all natural, like, I don't think I wore makeup for much of my mission. Um, it sweats all off by like 11 a.m. anyway, and so I stopped wearing makeup probably a couple months into my mission, especially in the summertime. Um, and people love you regardless. And then also, I don't know, I'm 
I'm more of an athletic person, so it was really hard for me at the beginning to um, kind of let go of that because it's it's really easy to gain weight in that mission because you are fed so well. And so I would just suggest like, you know, personally find out where your balance is. Don't be so gung ho in the morning that you miss, you know, studies or anything like that because you will eat a lot more food than you ever have before in your life. Like hands down, you're going to have to stretch your stomach. Um, but I found a good balance and, you know, I did gain a little weight, but I mean, the people look at you and they say, oh, girl, you skinny. <laughs> so they give you more food. And so it worked out and I've been back for four months and I've lost most of that. And so I know some sisters are probably really self-conscious about the weight, but don't worry about it. Just enjoy your mission. And you look back on pictures and laugh because you're little chipmunk cheeks. But, you know, it's all worth it in the end. Yeah, just be ready to explore the islands on P days. You're able to go out hiking and bring appropriate clothes for that. The, the people there love you. Sometimes I would feel bad for the elders. <laughs> the people love the sisters and you can touch so many people that the elders cannot. And not just saying because you're girls versus boys, but um, there's definitely people out there that I had a special connection with that we were able to get through the doors because sister missionaries just carry a different you know, perspective and a different aura about them and people can kind of tell the difference. Not that one is better than the other, but certain people respond to different things. And so don't feel like you have to be all gung ho and um, just be yourself and the people will just love you for who you are. So. Salmon eggs, raw salmon eggs, or like I said, that sour poi that had mold growing in it. <laughs> We once had a drunk guy come knock on our door at 2 a.m. and he he was a member of the church but he was very less active and um, he was singing hymns to us and it was really just a strange experience and then a few weeks later we were tracting and we tracked it into him so out of the thousands of houses we could have tracked it into we tracked it into him again so that kind of freaked us out a little bit <laughs> but that was a funny and crazy experience. <laughs> Seeing the atonement work in my life, because um, you see it work in everybody else's life, but there was a point in my mission where I, I truly had a self turnaround. Mm -hmm. And so it was so cool to see how the things that you're teaching people, they're actually real. Like they apply to you. And even since coming back from my mission, applying to me continually. I think it has to do with obedience and love on um, both of the above. Love as in you, it's all about the love. There was an elder that always said that. He's like, I know it's cliche, but it's all about the love. It really is. As you open yourself up to love, miracles happen. And also obedience. Um, at the beginning of my mission, I chose not to be the most obedient. And it's so, it's almost awe-striking to compare like my journal entries from the first three months of my mission to the last. Because I am completely a different person. Um, not only because I grew through my mission, but I truly feel it was because of obedience that I was able to overcome a lot of my trials. So, Talking to people, random strangers, role playing, those kinds of things, communication. Um, there was a time at our mission where we would go bus stop contacting and there was a huge busy area and there was about eight bus stops and so we'd take laps. So we'd like go around to each bus stop and just use different approaches and it's literally the most scariest thing of your life. But as I've opened myself up to talk to strangers, I can just tell I have a lot more like drive to talk to people and it just it makes your life much more interesting. We had a couple tropical storm warnings where we had to stay in all day and the members load us, load us, loaded, sorry, loaded us up with a lot of food. Um, so we did have a couple of tropical storm. There was a lava flow incident. Um, one of the volcanoes exploded and houses were endangered um, as well as a snowstorm. So there's a variety of things you would not expect this palm tree white sand beach Hawaii to experience, but yeah. I think it was always seeing people who you knew had a testimony choose to reject the gospel. Um, especially in my last area, there's a lot of anti-Mormon literature. Just for some reason that area 
I mean, a member of the bishopric had been affected by it, and several people we were teaching. Um, one of our converts actually never was confirmed because of the same kind of things. And so it literally breaks your heart, you know, seeing, teaching these people, like going through all these struggles and then watching them. They, You want them to not have to use their agency. You just want to make them do it. But agency, just seeing people use their agency to deny the gospel. It's just heart-wrenching, so. I would know the scriptures a lot more and preach my gospel. I definitely wasn't prepared. And in the MTC, like, I just felt like I was a primary kid in elders quorum or something. I don't know. Like, I was so, so low at that point. Um, and just getting used to studying, like knowing how to study because the first probably six months of my mission, I wasted all of that time. Cause I was just like, I'm going to read the book of Mormon, you know, and you miss out all the important things the Lord wants you to hear. So just the study habits and really knowing the scriptures, the Bible, especially, um, I think growing up in the church, a lot of people, they don't know the Bible as well. And people will grill you. <laughs> you get the Bible bashers every once in a while. But just to know more about the Bible, too, to help explain the Book of Mormon in a very Christian community is very helpful. Sticking with it, you know, keep on going to church, reading your scriptures, going to the temple. I've seen a lot of miracles in my life because I've tried to attend the temple regularly it's really easy when you get home off that spiritual high to just kind of slide off. And I know that there's so many people that say that, but I think one of the things that helped me the most is get home and get busy. Like don't sit around. I came home and it was Christmas time. And a week later I was in school. I had my job. I was doing athletics. And so as far as for that adjustment that people talk about, I really didn't have too much of an issue, but I feel that my, um, other companions or people I served with who are home, just hanging with the family, you know, not working, doing those things, they have a harder time adjusting. So get ready for the ride of your life. <laughs> the next 18 months to two years of your life will be the hardest, the most difficult, the most heart wrenching, tear jerking, awful, yet wonderful and bittersweet time of your life. So enjoy every single day. When you walk into that mission field, be ready to work and work hard. Never lay down on the pillow at night knowing that you could have done harder, you know, worked harder throughout the day. Knock on that extra door. Talk to that extra person. When you feel like giving up, keep on going. The Lord will strengthen you through it. And don't listen to what they say about Hawaii just being a vacation because many people have this false perception of the mission, but it's all what you make it. The people are there and they are ready. So get ready to work. Get ready to teach. Know the lessons. You will be teaching several lessons a day. You will be teaching eight to ten lessons a day. Know your stuff. And just be prepared to give your all because you want to look back and know that it was all worth it. Take lots of pictures. Um, Hawaii is just a beautiful place, and I probably took thousands upon thousands of pictures, but I don't regret it one day. So elders especially. I feel like I would steal the elders' camera and take pictures for them because they wouldn't do it, and you just don't want to pass up those memories. Um, also, write in your journal. I wrote in my journal about every day of my mission, and that has been so cool to look back on. Um, and I would suggest keeping it separate. I had a spiritual journal and my day-to-day -day journal. So you write your crazy experiences and what you ate for dinner that night in your regular journal. And then in study, you really delve deep into your spiritual journal. And I only started that about halfway through my mission, and I really wish I would have done it from the beginning. Um, it really just adds an extra oomph to your study. Food is how you get to the hearts of the people eat the food, love the food, compliment the food, want more of it. Even if it's not the best you've ever had, say it is. Um, just learn to love the food and pray for that desire because it's that big of a deal in this culture that you're going to have to love it. Um, many, many members would be offended by missionaries who either maybe said something about their food or they didn't eat as much as they thought. So that's like a big, a big thing. The people will love you if you eat. So yeah. <laughs>
So in our mission, you have the opportunity to serve in language wards. And I personally never served in a language ward, but the people love when you know the language. So I would try to get to know hellos in all the languages. Um, Malo alele. <laughs> um, just know how to relate to people in that language, even as a simple greeting. And the people love it, especially when they see, um, they call white balangi. Um, when they see haoli white, um, they nickname <laughs> outsiders. When they see that you're embracing their language and their culture, they will automatically love you. And um, you will definitely have a place in their hearts as you really try your best to know the culture, to love it. And so, and that includes language.